Wonderful. I understand that we're live. Hello and welcome. 2021 was another turbulent year for all of us, I think, but it was another year of growth for the global solar and energy storage industries. And it's an ongoing expansion that's really been underpinned by innovation. That means increased efficiency and power output. It means new applications and it means costs going down. Hello and welcome to PV Magazine's virtual awards ceremony. This is looking back at the innovations um, that took place right throughout 2021 and right across the value chain as well. Um, we have seven award winners featured today and we'll be hearing from jury representatives for each category, sharing their insights and also joining in conversation with the winners. I'm Jonathan Gifford and it's a great pleasure to have your company here today. And I also want you to get involved in our virtual award ceremony. I'd really love for you to send through your questions. It's really easy to do so. You can ask questions of any of our award winners. You can also ask questions of the jury men members and also of our keynote speaker who'll be joining us in just a few moments. So look forward to that. But first, joining me also um, for our virtual awards ceremony today is PV Magazine editor, Mark Hutchins, who managed our awards process throughout 2021. Mark, what can you tell me about the 2021 PV Magazine Awards? Thanks, Jonathan, uh, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm very excited to be presenting these awards uh, today. 2021 was the biggest year so far for the PV Magazine Award. Uh, we received 205 entries from 30 different countries, uh, and we worked with a total of 19 independent jurors uh, to narrow these down, first to 32 finalists and ultimately to the seven winners that we are here today to announce. Uh, and a huge thank you, th first of all, to each of those jurors for sharing their time and expertise with us over much of last year. Uh, and we'll be hearing from many of the jurors later on in today's show. Uh, and our audience uh, will have the chance to meet and chat with them during the networking break as well. Uh, thanks also to all who took the time to submit an entry and the PV Magazine Award will be back in 2022. Uh, we'll be accepting entries once again, a little later in the year. So keep your eyes peeled for announcements there. Uh, and we'll kick off with our keynote speech and the first of today's winners uh, in just a moment. First though, back to Jonathan with some more practical info about today's event. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you also for managing our awards process. Um, really a huge amount of interest in our awards, which is fantastic to see. Well, um, just a little bit of um, admin stuff, some, some general housekeeping. Um, if you have any problems with this event app, Pro tip is always just refresh the browser. That always helps. Um, we will be making a recording of this event, so you can please share that with uh, friends or colleagues um, if they would uh, like. If they weren't able to attend live, and of course, one of the advantages of attending live is you can ask questions, and I do uh, really encourage you to do that and uh, send through your questions just on the right of this uh, main stage today, and we'll be getting to those questions right throughout the event. Um, now, uh, as Mark said, um, we, we've got uh, award categories right across the supply chain. Mark, can you take us through the categories for 2021? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, seven, seven categories uh, coming up today in the next couple of hours. Uh, so we'll kick off with Jonathan and the modules category, first of all, uh, right, right after Martin Green introduces us today. Uh, following that, we will have our editor, Marianne Valloon, announcing the winner in inverters. Uh, and then it'll be back over to me with the winners in manufacturing. Uh, before we take a short networking break, uh, and we do have have speed networking, uh, and and uh, each of the winners has a has a booth you can visit as well. Uh, so please stick around for the for the networking. Uh, then in the second half, the excellent Maria Maish will be presenting winners in battery energy storage systems. Uh, then I will be back once more with the BOS balance of systems category, uh, followed by our head of content and of PV Magazine's UP initiative, Becky Beats, with the sustainability category. Uh, and finally, we'll be back to Jonathan and to Frederica Egera with the winners of the publisher's pick. 
So lots of stuff to get to it through. I advise you to stick around and get involved. Take advantage of that network, networking opportunities. Take advantage of the opportunity to ask questions and hear from each of our award winners and jury representatives. But first up today, we have an address from a solar industry icon that really needs no introduction. He's generally considered the father of modern photovoltaics. Professor Martin Green established the UNSW's photovoltaics group way back in 1970. He, he developed the workhorse. Well, what is the workhorse today of this modern solar industry? The perk cell that was in the early 1980s. He has picked up far too many awards to list them all here, but some of them include the Global Energy Prize. He's been made a fellow of the Royal Soci Society of London. And just this year, he was awarded the Japan Prize for original and outstanding achievements in science and technology. Martin, thank you very much for joining us today. I heard there were a few technical glitches, but I hope that you are able to join our event. Martin, welcome. Well, hello. Uh, yeah, hello. I can. G'day, Martin. Great to have you a part of the event. Even if we can only hear you, that's that's still very good. I'm sure you've got lots of good things to share. And just a reminder to our attendees, please get involved. Send through any questions you have to Martin at any point during the event today. Now, Martin, we, I, I said in my introduction that it was way back in the, the 1980s. Was it 83 or 84 that you first sketched out the Perk Cell? It took some 30 years for that to kind of make, it way, make its way into mainstream production. Now, now we're seeing heterojunction, we're seeing Topcon, and even tandem cells uh, in the roadmap for the near future. How would you describe the speed at which technology is moving in today's solar industry? Yes, I, I guess the pace of things is really picking up. Like it took about 40 years to display the aluminium back surface field technology with Perk. <laughs> it was really very slow. And that all started happening about five years ago. But now we have a, a whole lineup of technologies ready to displace PERC. And I, I think this, this innovation is great. You know, the PERC, when it came onto the market, you saw an acceleration of the cost reduction of the photovoltaic product. You know, as the BSF sort of fought to maintain market share. So I think we'll see the same as these other technologies battle against Burke for their market share. Well, I, I mentioned Topcon and Heterojunction. They're in somewhat of a battle, but we're seeing the production capacities of both of those growing. But you as a researcher, you're always looking a little bit further than the than what's being industrialized today, and that includes tandem cells. Um, what do you see as the potential there for, for tandem cell technology? Yeah, I, I think... I think Tandem has to be the ultimate development of photovoltaic technology. And, and I think the way to go is probably um, a Tandem on silicon, just so that all the big manufacturers can get involved uh, early on and uh, use their resources to help commercialize a Tandem technology. And um, once you put one cell on silicon, you know, two cells is sort of a no brainer because you, you know, you, you, you're probably going to need like a TCO top contact and like a heterojunction type of contacting scheme with a, with a tandem, uh, you know, or a thin film contacting scheme, I guess it is essentially. But with the second cell, you don't have to worry about contacting it because it's, it's sort of buried in the stack. So um, a two-cell stack on, on silicon, and my prognosis is then that you... You, the manufacturers will have experience with these thin film cells stacked onto silicon, and you'll start asking the question, do we need silicon anymore? Because the input to the silicon to the output of the tandem gets cut down proportionally to the number of cells in the stack. So, you know, three cells stack, you do a third of the con contribution that a silicon cell would normally give you, and four cells stack down to a quarter, so you might say, well, we've got these thin film technologies working, so for a four-cell stack, we'll go to an all-thin film system. So, so, so I can by 2050, you know, we're back to thin films and the four-cell stack. Oh, well, so that's quite remarkable. So, so definitely in the near future, we'll be stacking on top of silicon, but you're saying way down the road, 2050, 
um, it, that we'll just have stacks and stacks of thin films. Yeah, I, I see it all laid out before me, but the main challenge is finding the cell to stack onto silicon. So um, perovskites are very popular, but you know there's uh, seven cell technologies that have got over twenty percent efficiency, which you need to have a to have any sensible reason for stacking onto silicon. You need something at least twenty percent efficient, and the perovskites have certainly done that. But of those seven technologies, silicon is by far the most stable technology. And perovskite is by far the least stable, so it's not really a marriage made in heaven. Okay, so so you still have you're continuing to be somewhat skeptical of perovskite as a next step. Yeah, I, I think well, it's well worth continuing work with perovskites as the technology has so many advantages, but I think we also need to be putting work in on other materials because the chances of perovskite making it. I think every year become a little bit dimmer as as the people battle to uh, to overcome the issue. And that's very much what your group is working on, as I understand, trying to identify these next generation semiconductors for photovoltaics. Yes, very much so. Is that what's what's looking promising? What what can we expect? Is there any leads in the near future? Well. I guess if you look at what thin film technologies have done well, you've got the two sixes and you've got the chalcodurides. And uh, we're, we're looking at chalcodurides, you know, can you develop a cell technology with the right band gap based on that technology that can get over 20% of it. And uh, that's, that's the big research challenge, I think, facing photovoltaics at the moment, is either getting the perovskite stable or finding another material that can give you a similar level of performance as the perovskite. Okay, well, we'll be continuing to keep an eye on that. Martin Green, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, it's a shame there are a few technical problems, but but I think we got there in the end, and it's wonderful to have you part a part of our event. All the best, Martin. Thank you, Jeremy. Bye. Now, let's move into our award winners today. Um, our first award ca category up is uh, for modules. It really is the workhorse of the PV industry. And in 2021, we saw a heap of um, challenges for cell and module supply, polysilicon, uh, transportation. There, there really was a plethora of challenges. And we actually saw prices heading up for the first time in some years. But of course, technological innovation really remains the key of our industry. And I'm really pleased that in 2021, in the modules category, we saw most of the big, well, really all of the big industry trends reflected in our entries and in our finalists. We saw high efficiency cells like Topcon and Heterojunction. We saw high density layouts, um, just fitting more cells onto the module surface area. Of course, large format modules, they really can't be avoided at all. Um, some kind of slick back black all black modules for the rooftop application and another app another application that was um, really notable and there was quite a number of uh, entries and in indeed a couple of finalists um, in the BIPV segment so it was really encouraging to see BIPV modules being worked on quite intensively by the industry and even one finalist that was aiming at unlocking the CNI, CNI segment, unlocking more of the CNI segment, really trying to spread solar's reach. As you can see now, all of our finalists, we saw Canadian Solar with the Haiku and Baiku 7 product, the large format module, Hevel Solar. Um, from Russia with their BIPV Hetero Junction module. Jinko Solar, the Tiger Pro N type with Topcon technology. Jollywood with its Niwa Black. Maxion with its air solar panel. Mitrex solar cl cladding from Canada. That's another BIPV solution. Um, REC with the Alpha Black, a Hetero Junction module. And Trina Solar with its Vertex series, which is the large format. We'll get to the winner in just a moment, but representing our jury today is um, Pierre Verlinden. The other jurors you can see there, Yali Jiang from Bloomberg, NEF and Jay Lin, Chief Consultant at PV Guider. But Pierre, you are joining us today. Thanks so much for taking part. I've just run through the finalists. What would you say about 
um, the entrance that we saw in 2021? What's your kind of takeaway from, from all the different technologies and solutions that you saw? Uh, th thank you, Jonathan, and good morning, Jonathan. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, I, it was uh, absolutely uh, great to have a chance to, to judge those, uh, those candidates. And I have to say, um, looking back uh, in the PV industry, that was pretty static in terms of technology in the era of uh, 2000 to 2010. We saw a lots of innovation between 2010, 2020, and I'm really glad to see that the innovation continues in, uh, in the, uh, the, this decade of uh, 2020. Um, it, it's really good to see, and we, we see a lot of energy coming from uh, energy of innovation coming from the, the PV industry. Um, first, we see larger wafers, uh, 182, 210 millimeters, MBB being, being uh, generalized, uh, half cells uh, also being uh, largely used in the industry with today a uh, non-destructive cutting, which is very important to cut those cells without destroying or damaging the efficiency. We see smaller gap between cells. Uh, we see uh, larger modules up to 650 watts now and um, bifacial, double glass, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so that's we see a lot of effort to uh, improve the module efficiency and reduce the uh, the loss from cells to modules. But also in terms of cell technology, uh, of course, Topcon and ATO junctions are uh, contenders to replace PERC. And uh, it's great to see that there's huge efforts in uh, in developing those technologies. And, and of course, they are they've been in um, well. For ATO Junction, they've been in the market for quite some time, and uh, there the goal to the the challenges is to reduce the cost of capex and the cost of manufacturing and reduce the material usage to be more sustainable. Um, and for Topcon, the the challenges is to uh, arrive to a standard technology because a lot of uh, players uh, uh, working with Topcon. They, they are trying different technology, different processes, and the industry in itself has not arrived to a consensus of standard technology. And that's really, really interesting. So uh, the, the, the finalists, uh, we had eight finalists for this, uh, this award. Uh, they were all very, very interesting in their own uh, introduction presentation. And it's glad, I was glad to see also uh, a significant amount of BIPV candidates um, and that was good, um, but if we look at the uh, what what's going to be the major impact in the industry, I think the winner and the, the contenders, the runner-up, uh, are really showing uh, the leads, the, uh, certain leadership in uh, technology innovation. And I think that that's really great. I'm very happy the, with the choice that we've made. Mm -hmm. And a wonderful summary, actually, when you set out all the different kind of technologies in the module, in the cell um, that are kind of informing these next generation of modules, it's really is, it's a very broad array of, of different technologies. Um, yeah, and yeah, and yeah. When, when you put it together like that, it's really quite, quite um, impressive. Now, um, you, you mentioned uh, Topcon technology, and we're going to talk about that with our winner. But first off, let's have a few words about the runners up or the runner up in the modules category it was Trina Solar for the Vertex series. Of course, Pierre, as former chief scientist of Trina Solar, you have a long relationship with Trina. But what is it about the, the, the Vertex um, that impressed not only you, but, but our jurors? Yeah, well, um, so people think Vertex is the big module, but it's not just the big module. Uh, it's um, a long time ago, um, Trina, uh, we realized at Trina that in the long term to reduce the cost uh, and reduce LCOE, uh, not just the cost of manufacturing, but also reduce the, the cost, uh, the savings due to, to BOS savings. Uh, we had to increase the size of the modules and increase the size of the wafers. And of course, it takes some time to, to bring uh, the industry to go from 156 to 210 millimeter. It's a big change. The whole supply chains need to adapt in terms of tools, uh, in terms of testing, in terms of uh, uh, glass, in terms of back sheets, etc. There, there's a lot of things that needs to 
to to go and fall together into that uh, that new standards. And it took some years. And they, I I think it's great to see that um, uh, Trina has taken the leadership in 210 millimeters. Uh, it's a little bit sad that the industry is is has having two standards for the moment, 182 and 210. Um, uh, both of them have their advantage and are great, but it would be great to see the industry with only one standard because that's what brings the cost down. Uh, but the, the Vertex is a, uh, it's a combination of, uh, of um, all the technologies that I mentioned uh, earlier in my presentation, uh, 210 millimeter, smaller gap between uh, cells, half cut uh, cells, uh, MBBs, the half cut with uh, non-destructive non -destructive, uh, cutting. Um, and then um, uh, the, the overall together provides a, a cost savings in manufacturing, but, and that was a surprise for many people, it's uh, the, the, actually the BOS savings is actually greater than the cost in manufacturing because you, you end up with, uh, with bigger modules and uh, uh, less cost in terms of wiring, et cetera, interconnections uh, and installation cost. And that's where the, the, the big savings is. And, and uh, uh, Trina claims that uh, the, the technology, the Vertex technology could save up to 3.6% in BOS, BOS savings uh, with Tracker and up to 6% on fixed tilt, which is very impressive. Uh, the Vertex modules goes up to 21.6% in efficiency, which is very impressive, um, with very high density interconnection. I, I think that leadership from Trina Solar is uh, it's really uh, nice to see, and I, I hope that uh, uh, the industry, well, I see, I see the industry is following that lead, so which is, uh, is very good. Indeed, and Trina's gone to a lot of efforts to kind of demonstrate these BOS savings as well, working with a lot of independent part parties to kind of build up that evidence. Well, um, let's now look at our winner. And our winner was a particular standout because of its cell technology. So it's with great pleasure that I can announce that jo Jollywood from China have, is the winner with the Niwa Black Module Series, representing the jury, uh, not the jury, representing Jollywood is Kathy Huang, the sales director for Europe. Kathy, thank you so much for joining us today. And congratulations to you um, and to the team at Jollywood for the for winning our 2021 uh, PV Magazine Award in the Modules category. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's our honor to receive this award from PV Magazine. Very Wonderful. honored. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm pleased to hear that. And it is indeed what's inside the module that really makes the Jollywood Niwa Black stand out. P uh, Pierre, I'll throw it over to you to represent the jury um, in conversation with Kathy about this uh, winning entry. Hi, thank you, Jonathan. Um, hello, Cathy. It's great. Congratulations for uh, for these awards. I think uh, your modules uh, shows uh, really uh, the, the essence of innovation in the PV industry. And I, I just wanted to say that um, one of the things I, I liked about your entry is that Jollywood has been courageously promoting ntype.com a long time ago. And, uh, as one of the driver of the development of top-down technology. Uh, your modules uh, has efficiency up to 21.94%, uh, which is very impressive. It could be double glass, bifacial. The, the cells have an 85% bifaciality factor, which is very good also. The, the, the black appearance is, is great. And uh, the module comes with in power of 400 five to 430 watts with 60 cells they all have Africa. the cells are 24.5 percent efficient which is uh, uh, top of the class in the, in topcon and what really excited me is your uh, new pulpit uh, technology that's uh, you are I think the only uh, topcon manufacturer to promote this technology and it's so um, maybe I, I would like to ask you um, if you could tell us a little bit more about Popate, um, or if you also could uh, in, tell us about your vision of the introduction of Topcon in the overall global market. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Pierre. You really know our technology very well. 
Um, actually, Jollywood has started production of、uh, Anti Cell since 2016, and it is the first batch of、uh, gigawatt level topcom in the world. And、uh, we set a world record of a twenty-five pole, twenty-five pole for twenty-five point four percent efficiency of a large size top consoles in September two thousand twenty-one, and the current max production efficiency can reach up to twenty-four point five percent. And for point paid technology, actually, it is original by Jolly Wood. And、uh, we have the core intellectual property rights. It is one of the most advanced topcom cell production technologies in the industry. And after R and D and the process improvement,、uh, Jolly Wood reduced the original twelve steps process of topcom to nine steps, and which not only greatly reduced costs but also maintains a higher yield rate. Jollywood's technological in- innovation not only brings higher conversion efficiency, but also greatly reduces production costs, and that's great. Yeah, Cathy, if、uh, I-、uh, I'd like to explain a little bit for the people attending this session, what is Popate exactly?、Um, I'd like to、um, uh, just give a, a, a quick summary.、Uh, The, the topcon technology requires the deposition of a polysilicon layer at the rear side of the cell.、Um, most、uh, um, manufacturers use either LPCVD for low pressure CVD deposition of polysilicon, or use a PCVD, a plasma enhanced CVD process, with a recrystallization after that to create the poly layer. So.、Um, Jollywood decide to use a popate, which actually stands for plasma oxidation and plasma assisted in situ doping deposition. It, it, it sounds like a whole program of、uh, things happening in one step. And、uh, you claim that you've been able to reduce the process from twelve step to nine step with、uh, with this technology. Could you could you explain a little bit more and、uh, and what's the uh, uh, the main cost savings that you achieve with this technology? Um, it's, it's especially we 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 reduce the steps of、uh, processing,、mm-hmm. and so this reduce our、uh, processing costs. And but also、um, we have some uh, different um, process on the cells to、um, uh, to increase the the efficiency of the, the solar cells.、Mm-hmm. Mm. So、I want to understand is that one of the main advantage is that you、uh, not only you do everything in situ in one step, but also you don't have to do the uh, uh, you don't have the wrap around、so、the deposition.、Yeah. You don't have to do an edge back. So that's a a, a big savings in the process、uh, sequence for Topcom. Yes, yes, we don't have the wrap around、um, uh, poly removal and and also.、Um, We have、uh, the、uh, the single side edge. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do you see in terms of、um, uh, development of topcon technology in the global market in the future? How do how do you see that growing? Yeah, actually, topcon cell technology is the、uh, currently the most mature technology,、uh, most of M type. Uh, technology、um, from the perspective of the expansion layout,、uh, topcom technology is also the main choice direction of cell technology in the future. We think、um, by the end of two thousand twenty one, it is claimed that the production capacity plan of topcom has already existed one hundred thirty gigawatt. Uh, the cumulative production capacity, including an under construction, is expected to exceed 50 gigawatt by the end of、uh, 2022, and it is expected to be close to 80 gigawatt by the end of、uh, 2023. With the rapid expansion of、uh, production capacity and the iteration of technology, the cost of M time modules will drop rapidly and will become mainstream. Products in the near future. Well, that's it. 
That's a big prediction. Gochi, gochi. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, um, Pierre. Trying to get a bit more information about uh, Pop Aid. We're always very interested. Hopefully, we we get to see some some more information uh, published soon. Pierre Felinden, our module jury representative. Thank you for your time. Congratulations, Kathy Huang. Thank you for joining us. Fifty gig gigawatts of Topcon, at least nameplate production capacity in twenty twenty two. That's very very exciting. Wonderful. Exactly. Congrat congratulations. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Kathy. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Okay, moving forward with our 2021 um, PV Magazine Awards virtual ceremony, we're now looking to power electronics. We need to get the power from the cell into the module, from the module um, onto the grid or into the battery, and that re generally requires power electronics. Marianne Valoon, um, you've been running our inverter category for the last few years. Um, how was 2021 um, from a technology standpoint um, in inverters? Thanks, Jonathan. Indeed, yeah. Um, from, from my side, first of all, congratulations also to the team from Jollywood uh, on that award win. Uh, and, and Jonathan, you noticed correctly, a module on its own, no matter how good it is and no matter how many PV Magazine awards it has won, <laughs> it is, makes no solar power generator, uh, starting with the issue that it produces the wrong type of power, DC. And for that, we have the inverter. Uh, but converting DC into AC is still the primary task for inverters, but it's by far not the only one. Over the last decades, they took more and more responsibilities such as monitoring uh, of all sorts of data and telemetry off the site, uh, maybe integrating storage or providing an interface for the grid operator to take control, to name just a few functions. And all this is happening thanks to the inverter. And this increasing list of functions was also reflected in the lineup of entries. Uh, overall, manufacturers from across the globe sent in 24 different inverters of all power ratings and design philosophies into the race. Uh, the vast majority of which were string inverters. The trend that has been growing over the last years and with it also the size of the string inverters. With two of our finalists, the Ampner, uh, a new brand from Finland, and Sangro, a well-established name in the industry, breached the 300 kilowatt mark on a string inverter. We also had a 255 kilowatt string inverter from Jinglong in the list of finalists, which is still a very impressive size. In fact, all uh, but one finalist were string inverters. Only the Power Electronics HEM power station uh, follows the central inverter approach, although it's actually many string inverters bundled into one central inverter. Other features that stood out uh, this year was an increasing number of entries that were hybrid inverters, meaning that they could handle storage and solar, the solar generator at the same time. Uh, this was true for GrowWatt, Goodwe, and Focus, and the FEMA residential system sized string inverters that have made it into the list of finalists. Also, with uh, FEMA and Sangro's contribution to the list, we have seen more inverters featuring advanced grid support functions, a trend that grows in importance in some more mature markets. And we've also seen some inverters featuring fairly impressive resilience against adverse weather conditions, such as extreme cold temperatures or very high altitudes. Uh, grow what's small off-grid inverter, but also Ampner and Sangro's inverters are examples for this. Uh, this goes to show that PV is ready to take on every terrain, even after all the nice and comfy spots have been taken. Uh, since there are so many scales by which to measure how good an inverter is, power density, topology, weight, the types of used materials, the types of uh, transistors or functionality, such as or uninterrupted power supply, we summoned a jury of experts to sort through the jungle of features. On this year's inverter category jury, we had Marco Jung, uh, who is the part, department head of power electronics at the Fraunhofer Institute of Energy Economics and Energy System Technology. And he's also a professor for power electronics at the bonn rhein Sieg University of Applied Science. Also on this year's jury, we had Jenya Maidbray, who is the CEO and co-founder of downstream testing lab, PV Evolution Labs, over in California. And we welcomed again Haki Karakawalan, who is the founder of KRC Consulting and looks back on 15 years of providing grid integration training for utilities and other solar professionals. And of course, we had again IHS Markets Associate Director of Clean Energy Technology, Cormac Gilligan, joining us. And Cormac is also joining us here on the stage today to shed some light why the jury decided for the winner. Thanks for joining us today, Cormac. 
Uh, thanks, Marianne. Well, and now we should lift the curtain. And the winner of this year's award is Sungrow's SG 350HX. And you guessed it, it's a 350 kilowatt string inverter. Comic, can you tell us some of the reasons why the jury thought this was a particularly compelling entry? Yeah, th thanks, Marianne. Uh, yeah, so the, as mentioned, there was lots of great nominations this year. And uh, over the last few years, many of people in the industry might know that there's been a a trend across the power electronics and power conversion markets towards uh, larger power rating inverters. So this one, for example, SunGrows is reaching a, a new uh, pinnacle at 350 kilowatt, um, which is quite a large uh, rating for string inverters that can be used in utility scale ground mount solutions. Among some other notable features, was in particular the ability, as you mentioned, to interact with the grid and deal with uh, weaker grids. So one of the things that we're seeing becoming more important is the ability of inverters to uh, operate with short circuit ratios that are very low. And this basically means where as renewable can become a higher percentage, it can increase the level of volatility and, and an inverters as we often say, are some of the brains of the operations. They're going to have to deal with helping with grid stability. Um, and then a few other notable features have been things such as the amount of uh, MPPPTs, in this case, 16, that SunGrow was offering, and also the ability to interact with other pieces of the solar system. So, for example, with solar trackers when we're talking about uh, ground mount applications. All right, thanks for this insight, Cormac. Well, it's time to get the representative or the representatives of uh, Sangro onto the stage. Uh, Mozart, the director of Germany CEC and the Nordics has is joining us today and he's brought with him his colleague, uh, Simon Hammer um, on the stage. Happy to Hello. have you here today. Good morning Good. and congratulations from PV Magazine and I guess also the jury. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sandro is very honored to award. Thank you. Cormac, I believe that uh, in making this decision, um, there was lots of debate and lots of discussion um, among the jury and, and potentially there were some questions left open uh, that you yeah. might want to ask. Marianne. Um, yeah, so, you know, as part of our consideration, the jury was evaluating many of these different inverters across residential, commercial, and utility scale with many different factors. So one of the trends, and I think we touched on it in the in the last session, was around the increasing adoption of bifacial and higher powered uh, solar modules over the last year or so. So uh, Moritz and Simon, um, how is the SunGrow product helping to assist with this trend of dealing with larger format modules uh, and dealing with the, the bigger form factor. Okay, um, so regarding the high power modules, we have to distinguish first of all between the M12 and the M10 modules. Um, regarding the M12 modules, which have the higher output current um, for this high output power, um, we um, adopted the uh, um, MPPT, IGPT design accordingly to be able to operate now with input currents of 20 amps per string, means 40 amp per MPPT. Um, this 40 amp version of the SG350 uh, has 12 MPPTs, so uh, 24 <laughs> strings. Nevertheless, we will also have a solution which is then more tailored for the M10 modules, which have comparably a higher output voltage. Uh, and there we will have the solution with 14 or 16 MPPTs, so um, 28 or 32 strings. Um, so that's our approach here for the high power modules. Thank you. And one of the other trends that we mentioned was the increasing shift towards both on the central and string inverter market, the trend towards larger power rating. Um, so it could be in this example, reaching 350 or in central inverters approaching maybe four megawatt or, or maybe larger. So do you think that the, we're starting to reach that limit or will the market continue to innovate uh, in the manufacturing and, and with other partners? What's, what's your view? 
Okay, so I'll, I'll take that one. Um, thanks for the question. Um, again, we wanted to thank you very much for this award. Um, Sangha was very honored to have this award, have received this award. Very good to see Martin Green. Um, I did my master's in PV 10 years ago at the UNSW. So now we're sitting, not in Sydney anymore, but in beautiful Munich, a bit colder than Sydney, but um, and good to see the, the, the UNSW is still doing a lot of research on this topic. Um, in terms of the inverter sizes, um, look, maybe just separate that into the string inverter and central inverter topic. Um, string inverter, at the moment, we see the 350 probably being the sweet spot in terms of size, you know, when we talk about BOS and LCOE topics, um, at the moment at least. Yeah? We have to see um, how the market is developing, how the, um, also how the modules obviously are developing on the, the inverters are also increasing in size uh, because continuously the mod modules are increasing in size. But um, at the moment, also in terms of the weight, the size of the Verda 350 seems to be a, 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 probably the, the maximum we can reach. But this is not to say that the inverters might not grow um, even further in the future. In terms of central inverters, um, it seems like the maximum size at the moment is around the 8 megawatts. Um, also there, let's see if it goes any bigger. But I think in the in central inverters, we've seen now for many years, um, you know, around the six to eight megawatts being the maximum. So we don't expect a huge step there anymore. What we do see is now actually a new um, inverter from Sunro coming into the market this year, um, which is a modular central inverter. So you can actually um, stack uh, modules next to each other, starting at one megawatt, going up to 8.8 .8 megawatts. So the customer can pretty much choose which size they want to um, uh, deploy into their, their system. Gives them more flexibility. New inverter, maybe also something for the jury to look at for next year. Um, but it's so there we see um, first time this modular approach. And um, looking at the string inverters, we will probably also see a development um, in the string inverter in the same um, direction, uh, meaning that uh, potentially in a few years' time, um, we will see string inverters being actually you know modular built. So you could maybe start at 100 kilowatt uh, module and then stacking the module uh, the, the inverters up to let's say maybe megawatt, yeah? So this, the same concept that we now see the central inverter potentially coming to the string inverter um, um, area and uh, again, giving the customer um, or the, the PV um, um, developer more flexibility, you know, because then you don't really need um, the separation between string and central inverters anymore, but you can pretty much um, have a string inverter if you want one megawatt and you stack it up um, to, to larger, um, you know, just um, centralized in the field to central inverter. Um, so this is the trend we see. Um, however, what we're working on at the moment already, Sandro is um, testing a few projects in, in China already with 2,000. With the 350 as well. Um, but we certainly see also the trend in, in the near future going into the, the higher voltage inputs, of the inverter, which then might also increase the size of the inverter. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you touched on some interesting points there such as you know um the ability in the future maybe to push towards higher voltages um and, all, and also to do with you know when we talk about china or other key markets in solar where solar is now reaching higher penetration rates in the overall power market or in the overall energy mix so inverters are having to deal with a lot more advanced grid features and provide them to help with grid stability so can you highlight to, to our listeners, anything, any features of this new product that will help in that aspect? Yeah, so uh, you're absolutely right uh, with the rising number of renewables connected to the grid. Um, this is definitely something we have to respond for inverter development. And um, I want to mention some features here for the SG350. First of all, um, the inverter, as you mentioned in the beginning, is able to operate in very weak grids. Um, so having more renewable capacity connected to the grids in the future, um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, it is it can be expected that the grid capacity will not catch up properly with this. Uh, we will have the situation that the short circuit ratio of the grid will uh, be lowering in the future. Um, so short circuit ratio means the short circuit capacity of the grid divided by the renewable energy, energy capacity. Um, a value around 10 is, let's say, a normal grid. Values below 3 is um, considered as a weak grid. 
and the SG350 is able to operate down to 1.16, uh, which is a very weak grid. Um, we do this by dynamic impedance remodeling and transient over voltage suppression, so that's a good adaptive algorithm um, to handle that issue. Um, Additionally, what is also getting more and more important is um, with higher penetration of renewables that the grid supporting features like reactive and active power provision um, has to be um, conducted very quickly. Um, so we need to respond very quickly on grid dispatch and um, therefore the 350 offers a reaction time or a respond time for reactive power of 30 milliseconds and for active power of 60 milliseconds, which is very quick, and adapting to those requirements. Um, yeah, last but not least, uh, I want to mention that we also have the reactive power at night function for the SG350, so to have the grid stabilization possibility also during night, which is also a big advantage to um, avoid additional SPETCOM measures um, so installation of additional devices, so this functionality is included in the 350. Well, well, it sounds like the grid of the future is in safe hands for now. So um, maybe Marianne, I'll, I'll pass back to you in case you have any last questions or comments you want to make. Indeed, indeed. Well, um, this was a great insight and a good sneak peek into the future of power electronics. And, and I enjoyed listening. Uh, to this and I'm excited for next year's entry, not just from Sungro, but of course also from, from all the other competitors and I believe Comic, you'll be uh, excited to see all these entries and, and assess them again. Well, um, congratulations again to you, Moritz and Simon and all the team from Sungro. Um, thanks Cormac for joining us today, but also thanks to all jurors for taking uh, the time to carefully assess the many great uh, products uh, that we've received this year again. And I guess uh, with this, uh, there's no further ado. I hand it over to Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Marianne, and congratulations uh, to Jollywood and to SunGrow as well, our first two winners for today. Uh, next up is manufacturing, uh, and in this category, we honour the latest and most innovative and potentially impactful developments in the upstream PV segment, uh, all the way from the raw materials that go into a PV module, a battery and, and other system components, uh, to the machinery and processes that put the finishing touches uh, to the end product. Uh, and despite the supply issues that have impacted the PV supply chain over this past year, uh, we have seen no real slowdown in the push for new and more efficient PV technologies uh, reflected in the rapid switch to new formats uh, and in M-type technologies as well, both of which were well represented among the entrants in this category uh, and indeed in the modules category uh, as well, as we saw in that great discussion earlier with Pierre for Linden. Uh, new applications and integration of PV into new environments and new devices, uh, whether that's floating PV, building integrated agrivoltaics uh, and many more, uh, have to bring together the needs of two quite different purposes often and will often require some, some innovative thinking when it comes to manufacturing processes. Uh, and there were plenty, plenty of those on show uh, among the entries in the manufacturing category uh, as well. Very encouraging as well to see a strong focus on sustainability in manufacturing this year. Plenty of solutions to get recycled and second life materials uh, back into the production stream. Something that I think most would agree is much needed uh, in solar as much as in any other industry. Uh, and those trends are very nicely reflected in the finalists uh, in manufacturing, which are Coveme with its Diamat high barrier back sheets. Uh, DuPont Tejian Films with its Mylar based uh, back sheet, Sono Motors for its vehicle integrated PV solution, and Techni Solar's RoboStack Laminator. Uh, those finalists were selected by our jury of independent experts consisting of Alison Siesler, a research fellow at UNSW, uh, Alex Barrows, research director at Exawatt, and Jonathan Govertz, a researcher with IMEC over in Belgium. Uh, representing the jury today, we have uh, Alex Barrows online with us. Uh, Alex, welcome. Thank you very much for joining. Morning, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> and just quickly, could you could you take us through uh, some of these finalists and what, what really stood out for you? Yeah, I, th I think we were all interested to see such a 
a varied set of entries this year covering uh, sort of the full spectrum that you might expect of wafer cell and module manufacturing processes, materials manufacturing, and then even some quite novel uh, manufacturing processes that we might not normally associate with PV. Uh, from the back sheet point of view, I think we were all uh, really encouraged to see both DuPont and Kaveme focusing on an increased uh, sort of sustainability and use of recycled materials. And obviously, as the industry scales, this is something that's going to be more and more important and that module buyers will be more and more aware of. So we were all quite encouraged with that, I think. Um, and then with the with the Technisolo, it was sort of an interesting idea in terms of enhancing in particular manufacturing for dual glass modules. They're obviously becoming a larger and larger part of the market as we shift towards bifacial. And then finally, from Sono Motors, I think it was a really interesting process uh, that they had technically uh, and interesting from the point of view of opening up uh, a new market that we're not used to thinking about in PV so much. Uh, absolutely. Uh, well, I, I will now announce uh, our, our winner in the manufacturing category uh, is Sono Motors for its vehicle integrated PV solution. Uh, that's a manufacturing process integrating solar cells directly into a panel into the panels of a vehicle. Uh, and we're delighted to be joined as well by Matthew Badrit, uh, group leader for solar at Sono Motors. Uh, congratulations, Matthew. And what does it mean to you and to Sono Motors to be chosen as a winner of the PV Magazine Award? Hi, everyone. Uh, first, thanks a lot for this prize. Uh, what does that mean? Well, that means a lot for us uh, because we really came a long way to develop this technology and uh, to have this recognition, this prize today is really a big honor. So we are really excited to be here and more about what we did and to present it to you. It's really great. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, great, great to have you with us. Uh, well, Alex, I will hand over to you for a moment. Um, I think this is a, a very new solution that, that should raise some some interesting questions for you, uh, as, as well as Alison and Jonathan on our on our jury. Yeah. Hi, Matthew. Thanks. Thanks very much for being with us. And uh... Well, congratulations on creating such an exciting process and vehicle and, uh, and helping push PV into new markets. To, to start off, could you tell us a little bit more about the manufacturing process and how it differs from sort of conventional uh, vehicle manufacturing? Yes, of course. So um, Zono Motors first. So we are an automotive company and we aim to create what we call solar electric vehicle, which means we really do believe that covering electric vehicle with solar is the next way to go in order to gather the energy from the sun and to input this energy directly onto the battery. Uh, when we started years ago, um, well, we faced a problem because uh, actually the only way to have PV on vehicle were just for the roof and based on glass. And we really wanted to have solar everywhere on the vehicle, which means that we had just to take that into our hands and to create a very new technology, a very new manufacturing process. And this process uh, consists of using injection molding. So we basically integrate the solar cells and manufacture the car body panel, the carrossery, in one step by injection molding, which means we use conventional solar cells and we shape them and integrate them into the polymer matrix of the body panel. And this is what makes everything really different because then we can really cover the full vehicle uh, with solar cells, meaning we can really increase the amount of energy uh, coming from the solar cells uh, into the battery and then help a lot uh, to decrease uh, the charging needs from electric vehicles. So that was a very long way and this is how we did that very different. And um, yeah, now, um, what do we see? What we have created also with this technology that it's very easy for us to uh, derivate this technology to other type of vehicle. I mean, our, our first goal has always been to develop our solar electric vehicle. But then now we see that this technology can be used in many other type of vehicle. And this is exactly the way we are going right now and this new manufacturing concept. So are you, are you planning on uh, collaborating with other vehicle manufacturers then? Or will it all be done in-house uh, by Sono Motors? Now, actually, we started a bit more than one year ago. Um, well, we, we did realize, I would say almost by accident, but many people contacted us. And then we did realize that this technology could have a lot more impact if we could offer the technology to other uh, car manufacturer or vehicle manufacturer. 
and more than one year ago, then we started to, to market this technology and we are already uh, a lot of talks and collaborating and delivering some uh, prototypes with other company uh, for different type of vehicle actually, because this technology then is so versatile that we, we could apply that to other vehicle. And we have now uh, collaborating also for company on the bus segment, on truck segment, uh, even on uh, boats. Uh, and we are in talk with uh, other car manufacturers to, to propose them this technology. Brilliant. And at the moment, I believe you're using uh, IBC back contact cells for the highest efficiency possible. Um, are there any process requirements uh, with the process that might uh, sort of limit what cells you can use or, or can you use pretty much any cell design in your process? So um, choosing IBC was uh, first more an aesthetical choice for us because uh, of, um, I would say, a customer requirement also in the automotive industry. Not everyone wants to see the solar cells um, or the bus bar on the solar cell. Uh, but in terms of process and the process we have created uh, can use any kind of solar cells. I mean, when we're talking about uh, silicon solar cells or monocrystalline silicon, it's really easy. When we're talking about uh, other solar cells like uh, thin films or why not in the future perovskite, uh, then we would need to slightly tune the process. But this is not that complicated in the sense that injection molding is a very generic process. And injection molding means you have a very broad range of available materials, temperature, uh, pressure to be used. And then we can tune this pressure, temperature, and even the shape of the vehicle uh, to be adapted to the, the best cell available. Because uh, not every vehicle would like to use IBC cells, could be because of the cost or of a reason. But I mean, that was also one of our goal to make sure that our process is really versatile so we can evolve our product in the future and take advantage of all the great research done by people like Martin Green on new generation of solar cells so we can integrate them in the future. That's great. Yeah, it sounds like it could be a really exciting market to apply some of the uh, sort of the highest efficiency sort of leading edge solar cells that we're seeing. Um, and then when's, when are you planning on having your first vehicles produced and, and sold? So we are planning to have our first vehicle in 2023. So this is our, the target and this is where we are aiming to uh, at the moment. So we are on a good track. And uh, But then uh, before that, we are also hoping to have uh, our technology in other vehicle on other segment um, uh, because some other vehicle get a different, I would say, a development timing. And then we are really hoping we could offer this technology also for other kind of a type of vehicle uh, before 2023. Oh, wow, brilliant. I'll, I'll look forward to seeing it. Me too. <laughs> I'll hand back to you there, Mark. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Alex uh, and Matthew. And uh, Matthew, one one more quick question uh, from me from my side. Uh, one thing I think that really impressed the jurors with this solution was the was the lightweight uh, nature of the of the cells. Um, do you expect this to be useful in in other applications aside from vehicle integrated PV? So yeah, indeed. Uh, in terms of weight, we can go down to four kilo per square meter, and this is thanks to injection molding. Um, Talking about application in other sectors that VIPV, um, first, I would say, first part of the answer is as a company, Zona Motors, we want to focus on VIPV. I mean, this is still a big market, a huge market, and we want really to keep focus on this market. Um, but then from my point of view, from my photovoltaic background, uh, definitely there could be more application, but this is not something that we would produce some manufacturers on the motors, but we could offer to license the technology. Why not uh, to people interested to use that in, I would say, conventional flat PV. Uh, that could be something we could really be open to. But as a company, we really want to focus on VIPV because we do think that uh, the transportation segment can contribute a lot in reducing the, reducing the CO2 emission worldwide making a change to electrical and making a change to solar electric vehicles. Uh, and and you and you mentioned uh, you mentioned the possibility of of other vehicle types as well. Um and what I think Sono already has a few a few partnerships here. Can you can you tell me anything more about this about about what what types we might see beyond the the Scion and sort of family sized cars? 
So at the moment, the, the main partnership we, we have uh, are uh, going to, to prototype project. And this is also what we want to start, I would say, slowly but surely with prototype project. And we have some uh, prototype projects signed uh, on, on both industry. I cannot name the partners, but also big trucks OEM and, uh, and bus OEM. So these are the three segments uh, pushing a lot. And last mile delivery vehicle, actually, we showed the product uh, at InterSolar. Um, last year actually with a uh, last mile delivery vehicle company from Germany. And these are the segment really pushing a lot. We do see that the, I would say delivery segment, uh, transportation vehicle segment is really looking forward to, to new solution to be greener as soon as possible. And this is where we see a lot of traction for our technology also. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Matthew. And I think it will indeed be genuinely exciting to see how how vehicle integrated PV develops uh, alongside electromobility more broadly uh, in the next few years. Uh, well, we will have to to wrap up there. Uh, so thanks a lot uh, to Alex Barrows uh, and congratulations once more to Matthew and Sono Motors, uh, the PV Magazine Award winner in manufacturing. Uh, coming up shortly, we have the winners in Battery Systems, BOS, Sustainability and our publisher's pick. Uh, first though, next, we will take a short break. Uh, so please do grab yourself a coffee uh, and join in some of our networking features. Uh, you can visit virtual booths for all of today's winners. Uh, and you can also set up your own table for a group chat or join in with some speed networking. Uh, so we'll see you over there. We are running a few minutes late uh, this morning, but at, but the break will still be 15 minutes. And we'll be back here uh, with Maria and the BESS award after that. Well, welcome back to our PV <clears throat> magazine 2021. Uh, awards ceremony. Thank you very much for your attention. And we have another series, our last batch of award winners for the year coming up in just a few moments. Um, and just a reminder that you can get in touch with all of our winners um, in the networking area or actually at um, on the backstage of this um, event app, not the backstage, the expo area of this event app. Um, and there are virtual booths, so you can ask them for any more information and please get involved in the discussion. You can send through questions as well to all of our speakers today. So don't hesitate to do that. You can just do that in the Q&A to the right of this main stage. Um, and I think we should get into our next batch of awards. Um, coming up, we have our sustainability award. We have our publisher's pick. But first, as you can see, the Battery Energy Storage System Award. This year, Maria Maish, PV Magazine, after having taken on a very important role of mum um, a little while ago, and she's going to be steering the award category going forward. Maria, can you take us through um, some of the entries and the, the finalists in 2021, and of course, reveal our winner? Sure, Jonathan, and thank you. And welcome back, everyone, from my side as well. If society is to shift away from fossil fuels and keep solar and wind installations rolling, large amounts of energy storage will be needed to keep balance, uh, to balance their intermittent nature. As an increasingly important piece of the puzzle, battery energy storage systems have already proved their power to meet the flexibility needs of a decarbonized electricity network and ensure system security. As we are witnessing more signs of what is hailed as the dawn of the battery age, there is a lot going on in the market. From the accelerating race for viable lithium ion alternatives to new business models emerging for both project owners and grid operators and all up to reuse and recycling. Innovation is front and center to all these developments and this is exactly what PV Magazine's Best Award category closely reflected. The long list of the Best Award entries in 2021 showcased an impressive variety of technological advancements in terms of chemistry, electronics, and software. Our jurors argued that there is still a lack of knowledge on what batteries as a relatively new type of asset can do and what PV Magazine's award entry and, and how PV Magazine's award entries showed just how many people across the sector are working to change this. 
These industry innovation efforts are reflected in the list of our best award finalists in alphabetical order these are. Amphenol with its thermal runaway sensing platform, Axel with its RVE series portable battery, BYD and its all-purpose energy storage battery box premium, Discover Battery and its Link Communication Gateway battery management system, End Phase and its End Charge modular storage system, Fluence and its smart energy trading platform, Home Power Solutions and its residential seasonal storage by SIA, Novum Engineering and its battery analytics solution, SunGrow uh, with its liquid cooled storage system, and finally, Voltfang with its second life batteries. Those finalists were assessed by our independent jury consisting of battery industry experts. Adrian Amigas, Battery Technology and Commercialization Analyst at the Faraday Institution. Alison Lennon, a Research and Teaching Academic at the School of Photovoltaic and Renewable Energy Engineering and ARC Future Fellow at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. Anna Dermani, a Lead Analyst on the Global Energy Storage Team at Wood Mackenzie Power and Renewables, where she focuses on Europe, Middle East and Africa storage markets. We are delighted that Anna is joining us today to represent our best jury. Anna, welcome and thanks for being here. Hi, Maria. Thank you for inviting me. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Uh, so looking back on our best award entrance in 2021, what are your main impressions? I would say it was very interesting. We had several competitive products. Uh, we had a very good discussion with jury. What we liked was that these products were not targeting only one specific segment. There were many of them were thinking out of box. So it was very interesting. Uh, so we, when we look at the product, we evaluated them against some parameters such as innovativeness, their impact on the market or their selling point. And I should confess most of this product actually very strong in at least one of these parameters. Uh, exactly. Thank you for highlighting that. It was also our impression that it was uh, the strongest list of best award entries we had to date. Um, but while uh, widely seen as a key technology to enable the shift away from fossil fuels, batteries aren't entirely free of risks. And while fire uh, incidents are rare, the importance of sensors and smoke detectors cannot be overstated. Amphenol, with its robust, robust thermal runaway detection for lithium ion stationary storage, was one of our top rated entries. Uh, Anna, what impressed you about this solution? I would say Amphenol is bringing a product to the market that addresses the concerns of different players and beneficiaries. Uh, at the same time, it's, it's trying to reduce the product cost and the overall system cost. And that's a very huge and important parameter to consider. They are putting together several already existing technology and bringing something new to the market. So there is no question about the uniqueness of their product. What we were thinking about it on the downside of this uh, and the negative side of this product was that they there are already some products in the market that they are doing the similar tasks to the market. So Amphenol needs to be very competitive in order to replace them or do the same task, but better. So overall, uh, what I would say about this product is that, I guess, is really would change the market. It will shift the market by reducing the cost and answering the concerns. But at the same time, the competition is high there. Indeed. Um, thank you very much for elaborating on this one. Um, so another highly commended product came from Berlin-based company Home Power Solutions. Anna, what are your thoughts about their all-in-one uh, residential seasonal storage? Yeah, this home power solution was very interesting. It was very impressive. It was a product that we thought the founder were really thinking out of the box and was amazing. They have only one solution for residential segments and a lot of innovativeness is going into that uh, unique product. But what we also discussed with the rest of juries is that if this product needed and where in which market and then in the markets that is needed, can households actually afford it? Because we, were, we had some concerns about the cost of product. 
So seasonal storage is a great idea. Um, it would be a great idea for households, but where do we need it? Um, the cost is always important when you are talking about households and end users. Thank you, Anna. Um, and thank you for highlighting all those aspects from the point of a market analyst. And finally, uh, we've come to our top rated solution. Uh, the winner of the PV Magazine 2021 Best Award is Fluence with its IQ bidding platform. Congratulations to the team. Representing our winner here today is Andrew Kelly, the country director for Fluence Digital in Australia. Good evening to you, Andrew. Thank you very much for joining us and congrats on taking the trophy this year. Hi, Maria, and, and hi, Anna. Wonderful to be here, and, and thank you so much to PV Magazine uh, and the jurors for, for the award. Uh, it, this is a really a great honour and, and a wonderful surprise. So we, we've put a lot of work into this technology, so it, it's just fantastic to be to be recognised along with, with so many of the other the candidates here today. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Andrew. That was lovely to hear. Uh, so first, a few words about our winning solution. Uh, Fluence's IQ platform is a bidding software for grid scale energy storage and renewable assets, which uses artificial intelligence, advanced price forecasting, portfolio optimization and market bidding automation. By ensuring storage systems and renewable assets are responding optimally to market and reliability needs, IQ Bidding Platform is said to be able to increase revenue and operational efficiency for battery-based energy storage by 40 to 50 percent and revenue for standalone re renewable energy assets by over 10 percent. So our jury was most impressed about your bidding software and in particular its potential to improve the best position in the market with services and services it provides. Knowing that it wasn't easy for them to choose the winner, given the many great applications we received, I would now like to hand over to Anna to further discuss with you your IQ bidding platform. Yeah, Anna, sure, thank you. you. Um, thank you. So first of all, hi, Andrew. We really enjoyed reviewing this Fluence IQ bidding application. And it's, it's, it is an impro impressive product. We believe that this product will have a huge impact on the market. It will unlock business cases for energy storage, as it is an issue in yeah, several regions. The main things people are looking is that like how I can make money with my energy storage system. And we believe that your application uh, can do that, can help uh, clients and industrial players to do better with their energy storage systems and with that we will see more investment in battery storage which is needed for a successful energy transition. We also had some questions which I'm happy to be here and getting the chance and opportunity to ask you them. So the first one that came to our mind is that when we were reviewing our application is that this IQ bidding application is currently currently only available in Australia and Kaiser in US, right? So why is it that? Why is it not already in the other market, for example, in Europe? And when do you think you will introduce your product to different regions? Great question, Anna. And, and thanks for the, the very kind words as well um, about the future of the technology. Um, yes. So you're correct. The, the product's currently only available in Australia and California. Um, and just for context, the reason that we originally selected Australia and, and California as our, our launch markets was because they're some of the most volatile electricity markets in the world. Um, Australia, for example, is an energy only market. Um, so there's no capacity payments. Um, it's, it's a real time only trading market. So there's no day ahead. Um, market um, and, and prices can can go from from up to fifteen thousand dollars per megawatt hour down to to minus a thousand dollars per mega per megawatt hour. So it's so it's a very challenging power market for generators uh, and asset owners to operate in. So we see huge volatility, and so it was it was really for us it was the perfect market for us to launch the product um, to test its viability and 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 to sort of help customers solve some of the problems they were experiencing in, in the market. In terms of future markets, um, as I'm sure you, 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 you're aware, um, every electricity market is, is slightly different. Um, and, you know, every market has their own rules and regulations and, and market framework. And it, it takes our team some, 
some time to reconfigure the software to suit each market's new rules and regulations and, and structure. We essentially codify all of, all of those rules in the software. Um, so that takes some time. Um, we're, we're currently very actively working on our, our market expansion plans. Nothing's been announced yet, so I probably can't say too much about that, but I expect we'll probably see some, some big announcements in, in the not too distant future. Ah, looking forward to that then. So, uh, as I said, like we we really see value in your products. And then, for example, one of the questions we had is that, like, why only these regions? The second one on the same line of thoughts was that, why uh, is your application? Does it work with different type of battery and energy storage systems? Because I know you also provide products and you supply battery for some customers. But you wonder if it's, it is actually working with different type of products, regardless of who is supplying that. Yes, it does. So um, we consider ourselves to be technology agnostic. So, so our, our software can work with, with uh, systems provided by any, any supplier. And, and really, we, we made quite a clear strategic decision when we were um, launching the product that we could have the most impact on the industry and, and you know, help facilitate the, the transition to, 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 to renewable energy and clean energy faster by by bringing this technology to all assets su supplied by all all suppliers so um obviously we, you know we have very seamless integration with with the, the fluence battery storage systems um but we can we can work with anyone so you know for example in, in california we're, we're using our software on on a on a tesla battery storage system um and in, in australia we're, we're working with a number of other um battery storage system suppliers and we're currently integrating with them so yes we 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 consider ourselves able to work with everyone okay that's a great news so i have one more question for you and that's uh, when we read about your uh, bidding application you say you maximize the value of solar wind and energy storage assets so all these three products but i i wonder if your application brings similar added value to all of these assets or you think like if you consider your application for one of these assets wind solar or storage it is more impactful the result that we see at the end on our business than the other product yeah, great question. Um, and, and I guess it kind of depends on how you how you measure value. Um, we generally think about the value we de deliver to our customers in terms of revenue and, and increasing the revenue that uh, an asset can can earn by, by using our software. Um, and, you know, we've the, the software can deliver significant revenue uplift to all, all three of those asset classes that you that you just named so solar wind and and, and battery storage systems um, because you know, operating all of those asset classes in a wholesale power market it, it's really challenging um, there's a lot of decisions that need to be made and and so the software um, you know solves a lot of those challenges for our customers but the 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 as a general rule of thumb the, the platform will Will deliver more value to to battery storage systems, and that's because battery storage systems are a lot more complicated to to operate and, and trade in a, in the wholesale power market. There's you have to think about charging and discharging. You also have to think about the the various services that the the system can provide, and so there's lots of decisions you have to make, and you have to make those decisions very quickly. And so software is is very well suited to solving some of those complex trading challenges and and that's why we see you know a, a lot of potential for this technology to to help improve the, the financial outcomes of, of battery energy storage systems yeah i can continue with my list of questions but i think i should stop because we have limited time maria yes we are running out of time uh, but thank you both this was very informative i i really enjoyed um and once again thanks a lot to anna and uh, our other jurors for taking the time to assess our best award applicants and congratulations once again to andrew and fluence pv magazine award winner in the best category 2021 
Coming up next is our balance of system category. And with that said, I'll hand over to you, Mark. Thank, uh, thank you, Maria. And interestingly, uh, one more concern uh, on the ESS award. Uh, next up, the BOS, balance of systems category, uh, where we have sought those innovations, large and small, that support the core components uh, of, of the module and inverter, uh, bring cost reductions, energy yield boosts, uh, or, or make life that little bit easier for installers and, and operations and maintenance providers. Uh, and we really did see a wide range of new innovations in, in very different market se segments in this category, uh, reflecting the growing diversity of PV applications beyond the usual rooftop and, and ground mount installations. Uh, but plenty going on within those segments as well, ever more sophisticated software solutions promising optimization and automization of almost every aspect uh, of, of PV plant operation. Uh, and while there were plenty of high tech solutions on show in this category, uh, the most impactful solution can also be the simplest one. Uh, and we see both approaches very well represented uh, among the finalists this year uh, up on your screen now. Those are Axial Structural for its blocking system, uh, Ampere Cloud with the monitoring solution, uh, Cab Solar's cable management and grounding uh, solution, Earthos Earth Mount Racking. Uh, ETH Zurich with the adaptive solar facade, uh, Fraxun's soiling loss management system, uh, GIZ, that's the uh, German Society for International Cooperations, PV Port. Connector and uh, Studer's cable, uh, specifically for floating PV uh, at, uh, applications. Uh, and those finalists were picked out from the many BOS entries received by our jurors, uh, Camila Ramos, a managing director at Clean Energy Latin America, Lida Rivera, director of engineering at RES Americas, uh, and Nicholas Schuller, partner at Everose. Uh, and Nicholas is with us today representing the jury. Uh, Nicholas, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. This uh, hi, hi, Mark. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Is the sound okay? Thank you. I can I can hear you loud and clear. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so so Nicholas, quite quite a few finalists in this category. Uh, could you could you take us quickly through some of the key trends and and what really stood out for you? Yeah, that's a tough task you're you're asking me to to perform, Mark, in such a short short time. Uh, but that's great. Thanks again uh, for for inviting me to to participate to to this uh, jury. That was really uh, instructive, interesting. Uh, it's it's difficult. Uh, we are talking about balance of system. There are so many different approaches. I think what's interesting is that we see innovation in all aspects of of PV development. For instance, uh, racking system. We've we've seen interesting approach of trackers. We've seen interesting, uh, very simple to deploy solutions for fixed tilt. Uh, we've had this, this quite advanced uh, proposal um, from ETH Zurich for, for BAPV, uh, very high, uh, high technology content. Uh, but we, we had also interesting insights like the, the, the uh, big questions for, for dry climate, soiling, soiling monitoring, and how to decide when, when to clean. Um, Development for, for FPV also. Uh, I had a particular interest in, in this uh, cable development. This is a big uh, potential market, in particular, for instance, a market I know well in France, a lot of opportunities in floating and poor cable connection can be a big issue. As a matter of fact, not only for floating. Um, and obviously uh, also the how to pass and, and install cables, earthing and all, all those uh, issues that yeah, but may, may seem trivial, but can lead to to very uh, poor performing uh, assets. So, so it's good to see, yeah, that there are plenty of ideas and a lot of people developing uh, innovative solutions in all aspects of of the uh, PV balance of system. I say. Very, absolutely, uh, Nicholas. Great, great to see uh, such such a such broad sort of in, innovation in in many different areas. Uh, 
Well, well, we can now we can now uh, announce the winner in the BOS category uh, is Cab Solar for its integrated grounding messenger wire system. Uh, that's a, a solution for both cable management and grounding in in a large scale PV system. Uh, and it is manufactured by Cab uh, in Pennsylvania uh, by people with blindness and other disabilities uh, aiming to foster independence for disabled people in the community. Uh, and we are delighted to have Tim Wedding, Solar Program Manager at Cab Solar with us. Uh, Tim, thanks thanks very much for joining. Uh, I know it's still quite an unsociable hour over there in Pennsylvania. Uh, so we really appreciate you staying up. Uh, and what does it mean to, to you and to Cab Solar uh, to be chosen as a winner? This is Frederike from the back end. We're currently having <coughs> difficulties so um tim is joining oh my my apologies uh for the for the technical hitch uh, folks uh well well while we while we wait for tim to get online uh, uh nicholas what what stood out for for you about this about this solution well i think we we, we had uh very interesting discussions uh with my co-jurors um yeah maybe maybe a word that that was quite instructive because we had very different backgrounds so it was interesting to sit at the virtual table and discuss the solution. But I think this is an example of, of um, what seems to be a very, a very smart and simple solution. So we, we, we love innovation. I mentioned some, some yeah, high technology content. This is on the, on the other um, side of the spectrum, I'd say. Uh, to some extent, low tech, simple, but 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 it, it, it's not negative. I mean, you have to find solutions. As I said, when you install the wires, if it's poorly done, it can lead to to big issues over cost. Uh, if you have to to rewire your entire asset, uh, it is a it is a real issue, and we've seen sometimes uh, very important uh, maintenance expense to 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 change part or, or the entirety of DC cabling. So a smart um, approach, smart solution uh that allows you to 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 have yeah those two functionalities grounding and uh the 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 kind of cable tray you're creating on, on, on the way by installing those those specific hooks i think it's it's uh it's a brilliant idea and we were quite uh sensible to to the way cab is manufacturing and the approach of involving people with uh disabilities so so i think it's it's also nice to consider the entire chain, not only once you've got your asset up and running and feeding electrons to the grid, but how you came here, how you select your hardware uh, from nuts and bolts to modules. So yeah, all, all the components required, right? Okay, and so 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 for I mean for for you, Nicholas, as an as an engineer, so just just having the cables, uh, you know, uh, ac accessible like this can can make a big difference later later on when it comes to to operations. Yes, absolutely. But it, I mean, you sometimes see cables accessible, but it's just a mess, you know. So here it's a brilliant solution because definitely you can easily access, you can easily check if something is wrong. Uh, well, the, 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 the picture you selected is quite uh, illustrative of what can be done uh, with possibility also to, to, to have different kind of, of cables. I understand you could have on one side uh, string cables, on the other side, cables from the uh, junction box or maybe AC from the inverters to go to the transformer. Uh, I think you, you have as many possibilities as, as you want. And that's the beauty. You've got one uh, reference. You attach it to your grounding cable and, and it's easy to, yeah, to, to, to follow and to understand. There are other solutions like trenches. Obviously, once it's done, you don't see a single cable. So, so visually, it's very nice. But if you've got a maintenance issue, it can become a nightmare. Uh, this is yeah much more flexible and and easy to to repair if needed or, or just to monitor uh, and and i guess this is this is something i guess would have to be built into the design from the from the start it would be once you've once you've made a mess of your cables it would be quite difficult to 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 retrofit something like this yeah um reworking ca cable is always a big uh, is a big issue and I think here again, Cap Solution is an interesting tool because precisely if you're on site where, where for for some reason the the installation of cable was was not properly done, uh, this is relatively easy to adapt to to any situation because precisely you you don't need heavy cable trays, you don't need trenches, 
so you you can um you can definitely use this as as a retrofit uh, i guess and allow to to easily have a much better uh, cable management of of your asset okay and and i mean i think we we wanted to give cab solar the award uh, uh you know for its for its technology uh, obviously the the way it's manufactured uh, is uh, is is another bonus as well and um, what what do you think what do you think of that nicolas that 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 was a point uh, I, I mean we we were intrigued uh, it, it's it's a pity we don't manage to have to have tim because i was really curious about um <clears throat> hearing from from him how, how cab is is operating i mean my my understanding is not a so to say conventional company but rather an association so from the it's its core dna to to involve people uh who have uh, who are disabled uh, and uh, it, it's rather nice to see that there are opportunities of development thanks to solar for for people who, who will unfortunately face uh, difficulties because of, because of their handicap so so it is uh, it is great uh, i've seen also to mention cap uh, development so far it's been in the Americas but not only in the US uh, I think in several South American countries also in Canada and uh, they they announce uh, five gigawatt of assets that uh, use their solution so so I think it's it's also good to see that they have quite an impressive volume um, I, I hope they can deploy this solution uh, more globally uh, I, I would be delighted to to see this uh, this system uh, deployed in Europe, for instance, uh, and and yeah, that's that's interesting that you you say that. I think it's primarily a solution for the for really very large projects. Um, you you think it could be useful for the well, usually usually slightly smaller uh, installations that we see in Europe. Oh yes, absolutely. I think I, I mean, yeah, we 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 know that our uh, American friends have the the benefit of large lands. And and uh, tens or hundreds of megawatts are easy to be built, but uh, the truth is we we've got some some large systems to uh, deployed uh, in, in Europe as well. I mean, and and even if it's only one megawatt, cabling is still an important uh, aspect of your installation. You know, so so I guess, and and because you start with those hooks, and basically the 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 driver is your grounding cable, uh, it, it's very easy. Uh, I. Could imagine maybe using this to to some extent for rooftop. Uh, the market is developing larger and larger rooftop system. I mean, 100, 500, one megawatt. It's already a nice installation, and and so cable management is also an important um, part of it. Uh, absolutely. Uh, well. Unfortunately, I have just had confirmation uh, that we we won't be able to get Tim uh, on online today, uh, thanks to the to the events guys for 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 working very hard to to fix that technical hitch. But uh, yeah, Tim won't be unable to join us. Uh, but uh, they so Cab Solar will be on the expo area in the in the networking uh, uh, area uh, after after we after we wrap up with the last two categories today. Uh, so, so please join him there. I think we will probably also follow up uh, with with an interview in the in the magazine uh, as well later on. Uh, but uh, we will have to to wrap up there, uh, unfortunately. But thank you very much for joining us, uh, uh, Nicholas. Yeah, well, thanks a lot, Mark, for for this invitation, and uh, well done. A very interesting day so far. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, well, still to come, we have the publisher's pick. Uh, and next up, I will leave you with Becky Beats, who is all set to announce the winners in the sustainability category. Uh, Becky, over to you. Thank you, Mark. And congratulations to Cab Solar for the BOS award. It was unfortunate that Tim couldn't join, um, but we look forward to hearing from them later on. So we are now almost ready to present the third annual PB Magazine Sustainability Award which also forms part of our UP initiative. We launched the initiative in 2019 to highlight sustainability issues in the solar and energy storage industries and to discuss practical solutions to address them. As Jenny Chase mentioned in last year's award ceremony, sustainability is inherently present in the industry on many levels. Despite this, there are challenges to overcome and this award endeavors to recognize those companies that are going above and beyond to set a new green status quo. Two key aspects of sustainability are circularity and systemic thinking. 
i.e. looking beyond our own environmental impact to understand how our actions affect the wider ecosystem and its myriad participants. It is vital to recognise how we function within the whole Earth ecosystem and how each decision we make has a knock-on effect. And this is something that's definitely been reflected in this year's applications. Indeed, it's been wonderful to not only see a record number of entries submitted to this award category, but also the sheer breadth of companies applying, both geographically, with submissions from Europe, the US, Australia, Africa, and Central America, and in terms of how they are linked to the solar industry. Looking at our finalists, we received applications from established industry players like First Solar, Fronius, Dow Chemicals and Maxian, all of which are taking powerful steps in solar sustainability. And smaller or newer entrants like microgrid technology specialist Alexis Energy, Ignite Power, which is working on solar electrification projects in sub-Saharan Africa, Pivot Energy, a developer, financer, builder and manager of solar and storage projects, reusable pallet company PV Pallet, Circular Modular Re Recycler Flax Res, Viking Cold Solutions, a thermal energy management company offering long duration thermal energy storage right. systems for protecting food quality, and Zonnext, a social platform for orphan solar panels. Then there were those businesses whose work is not directly related to energy, yet which are starting to embrace cleaner alternatives and have the potential to broaden the uptake of solar, like Grupo Aristos, and the New York City Housing Authority. I know that this year's jurors, Jenny Chase, manager of Solar Insight at Bloomberg NEF, who's joining us now, and Nancy Gillis, CEO of the Green Electronics Council in EPIT, had a very difficult time deciding on the winner. And it really was very close between them and the two who were highly commended, namely Aristos Real Estate, a part of Grupo Aristos from El Salvador, which powers 100% of its industrial buildings with rooftop PV, and the New York City Housing Authority, the US's largest public housing authority, which has released a new sustainability agenda that aims, among other goals, to host 30 megawatts of renewables on its properties by 2026. Hi, Jenny, and thank you for joining us and for representing the Sustainability Award Jury today. Hello, everyone. And before we reveal our winner, could you tell us what was so interesting about Aristos and NYCHA? Um, so what we <clears throat> normally this award is not about um, <clears throat> companies that deploy solar that much unless it's really interesting. But what we liked about Aristos was that they were um, going out of their way to put solar on office properties in uh, El Salvador and really um, this was, is really additional solar. It seems like stuff that wouldn't happen otherwise. And probably by next year, there'll be loads of applications like that because every manager of commercial property will be doing that. And we'll, and we'll not be able to give every one of them an award. But we love that they were stepping out there and making it a selling point to companies that wanted office space. You can have solar. Probably it's quite economically attractive. And um, the New York body we found that interesting because it's just a way of bringing down the u.s cost and getting getting solar on roofs in the u.s for people that wouldn't otherwise have done it great and and what were your overall thoughts on the award entries this year compared to last year there was a really interesting mix it was a strong pool there were some great companies out there doing a lot of interesting things in all areas of sustainability and it was really hard to make a choice yeah. <laughs> I know you deliberated for a while there over the, the various applications, but as we all know, there can only be one winner. And this year, Jenny and Nancy finally decided to award that honor to Viking Cold Solutions, a US-based thermal energy management company offering long duration thermal energy storage systems for protecting food quality. Jenny, what was it in the end that persuaded both yourself and Nancy to hand Viking the award? Well, it's not a new idea what Viking Cold is doing. And they are a storage company, but they're also a load shifting company. And for the solar industry, a massive challenge right now is basically cannibalization. Solar eats itself. All the solar plants generate power at the same time. And 
load traditionally doesn't follow availability of electricity. And what Viking Cold can do is shift that demand for two times when there is solar power available. And that is really exciting. And it's not just, okay, batteries can do that. We all know batteries can do that. But this is a really low capex way of doing it. And it's a really high efficiency way of doing it. And it, it's smart. It could be responsive to local conditions as well. And we just love that. And we haven't seen that embodied in, we've seen the idea kicking around, but I haven't seen it embodied in a company quite so precisely before. Thank you, Jenny. So without further ado, I am delighted to welcome James Bell, CEO of Viking Cold Solutions to the stage. Congratulations, James, and thank you for getting up so early today to talk to us. I believe it's around 5 a.m. in Texas right now. Good morning, Becky. Good morning, Jenny. Very happy to be here, and, and you're exactly right. It's just a few minutes before 5 a.m. Central Time. <laughs> well, we appreciate you coming online to speak to us. Um, tell me, what does this more award mean for you and for Viking? Well, the award, and thank you again, uh, Jenny, for outlining so well um, so many of the benefits already of the technology. And of course, this award from PV Magazine is a huge endorsement and uh, really amazing recognition for our team and for our clients who use the technology all over the world of the benefits of um, energy storage, but particularly in how it can benefit areas um, that directly contribute to sustainability, such as the global food chain, um, uh, which we all participate in. And Jenny referenced a little bit the elegance and the relatively low cost and the, the wide applications of the technology. So it was a really big moment for my team and I, and thank you both for, uh, for honoring us with the award. Well, we we're very pleased to, to hand you the award. Um, Jenny, I know you have some questions for James, so I'll hand over to you. Hi, James. So one of the first questions I was just going to ask is, um, are you looking for financing at the moment? Jenny, you know, early stage and rapidly growing companies, um, we're always looking uh, at the capital markets, uh, particularly these days with as much need as there is in the market. So yes, um, we're busy expanding right now globally, um, and we're in discussions with several groups on both an equity and a debt raise. Um, so the timing is actually quite good for both the award and that question. So I appreciate it. And I guess as an analyst, one thing I'm wondering is how defensible is this intellectual property as other it's companies very, try to do the same thing? It's a very good question. Um, as we know, there are other companies who've gone before us and companies that will uh, almost certainly fast follow us given the success we're having. Um, and there's some household names out there like Cal Mac who've been in this uh, in, the, in the big chiller space for many years um, and a number of kind of uh, um, smaller companies that are working on similar complementary technologies, primarily in the supermarket or grocery store areas. Um, but one of our unique competitive advantages here at, at Viking Cold is the fact that we have the, the broad use patents around us. We also have uh, proprietary phase change materials, which is the thermal storage element, which actually um, is the energy storage inside of a facility. Um, and then of course we have uh, um, many, many uh, um, other trade secrets and patented and copyrighted software. And that all together is a really good IP and technological moat that would take years and years of development to understand. Um, and we found that uh, many people want to partner with us to utilize the technology and their um, offerings. Uh, many strategic groups have come to us and said, listen, we've looked into thermal energy storage. We had a tough time with it. You guys have mastered it. Why don't we join venture? Why don't we co-develop? So that seems to be the route that the market is taking uh, behind us instead of the more direct competition or copying of the technology. Do we have what time for one more, Becky? Yeah, if you've got if you've got another question, feel free to go ahead. Um, I suppose what markets is, are your products available in right now? Right now, primarily North America and Central America, um, but we are right now uh, springboarding across the pond, and we're going to be in Europe and the UK. Very, very soon, we already have operating units in Australia. We have two channel partners in Asia who are taking us there. So hence the, uh, the rapid growth and also the, uh, um, the need for, for growth capital. Um, and we're essentially going there with our clients. This isn't uh, planting a flag. It's because some global companies um, that you all, all know very, very well have picked up the technology and we're busy expanding into their network. 
Thank you. I think, um, James, from my side, what I would like to know is um, obviously the supply chain and supply chain issues have been a very big topic this year. Um, and there's a big move globally to try and make supply chains more transparent. Um, sustainability is a big part, not just of your solution, but also your corporate culture. Can you talk a bit about your raw material procurement and how you ensure particularly that your suppliers also adhere to the same sustainability principles that you yourselves have set? Uh, great question, um, Becky. I mean, sustainability is in our DNA. And so from a standpoint of our supply chain, we look all the way um, to our initial sourcing and all the way through, we look at all three levels of tiers of, uh, of raw material acquisition. Um, and our primarily focus is on things we can take full circle. Um, anything we want to use, we want to be able to recycle and we want to get it from the most sustainable sources we can. Our largest single um, utilization is, is hydrated salts, salt water, essentially. So that's why we're a very, very green energy storage um, concept. So we want to responsibly acquire um, that water when we do it. And frankly, we think that there are ways to do that that actually help with certain challenges in, in areas. And we can do a distributed manufacturing. So there's a really great opportunity here to take manufacturing of our technology to places that really need jobs and sustainable energy storage because we're essentially behind the meter and we're localized for that. Although, as, uh, as Jenny pointed out, we have a very big effect on the grid from our storage. The fact that it's so inexpensive and pairs so well with solar and, uh, and with wind as far as storing renewable energy at less than two cents a kilowatt hour, um, we can see this being in every single freezer and refrigerator globally. Um, that's the goal and the mission of the company. Fantastic. Well, thank you, James, for those interesting insights. And it's very interesting to see what's going to happen in the next couple of years with biking as it expands um, and addresses such a crucial issue as food, um, which is also a very big sustainability challenge for our times. Um, it's time, unfortunately, to wrap up the section of our awards ceremony today. So I thank Jenny, um, our juror, for joining us and congratulations once again to James and the Viking Cold team for winning the 2021 Sustainability Awards. And now I'll hand back over to Jonathan for the last award category of the day, the publisher's pick. Thank you, Becky Beats. Thanks, James. Great to hear about Viking Cold Solutions, a really innovative approach. And Jenny, always lovely to see you. Thanks for everyone for sticking around um, right to the end of our um, PB Magazine Awards ceremony for the 2021 awards. I have heard from, um, that, from that Tim Wedding from um, Cab Solar is able to join us. So we'll see if we can get him on right at the end of um, this ceremony for a quick chat. Um, but before we do that, we've now come to the public pick category, which is a little bit different. We don't have an independent uh, jury to select this one. And the, the and the criteria by which the winner is selected is somewhat different. Also, Eckhard K. Guras, the publisher of PV Magazine, is the man behind the publisher's pick, but can't join us today. So Federica Egra, the head of events at PV Magazine, has volunteered to step in. Um, and I use the word volunteered very liberally in this occasion. Frederica joining us um, today yeah. and can you tell us give us a bit of background on the publishers award sure happy to i mean you already mentioned it a bit it's Eckhart who picks it but um instead of or in comparison to the other categories um the publishers pick doesn't just focus on one single product or innovation but rather takes a holistic view at an organization's contribution to the global pv industry so after careful consideration Eckhart, um our publisher picked this year's winner based on their trailblazing decade-long decade efforts on moving the energy transition forward before it became a global priority or trend. And their vision is a future in which 100% of the world's energy needs are covered by renewable sources such as solar PV. And I think that's something we can all support. Um, so Absolutely. We <laughs> so we're delighted um, to award this year's publisher's pick to the Austrian company Fronius International. Their track, their track records and commitment to sustainability and innovation speak for themselves. But here today um, to represent Fronius is Ulrich Winter, head of energy um, of solar energy Fronius Germany. And there you are, Ulrich. Welcome. Hello to everybody. Hello to the world. 
<laughs> Hi. Um, so I can see uh, in the beautiful award trophy right there, Ulrich. Um, can you it tell is. us a bit? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for placing it right there. Can you tell us uh, a bit about what this awards mean, award means to you and Fronia? Yeah, sure. Well, Fronia has been um, around for quite a long time. As we just said, we started with solar off, uh, we started off in the early 90s. And that was the time when many people told us that this crazy solar stuff will never work, will never pay off. And in over the decades, we've seen um, quite a number of ups and downs in the whole industry, partially um, caused by governmental decisions. Um, but you never given up. We always came up with, with new ideas, with new approaches, with new solutions, uh, ended sector coupling solutions, all those things. And um, the word actually means to us that, that you are say, seeing our contribution, trying to push the whole solar idea forward and forward ever more, expand the limits. And it's great to see this acknowledged. So thank you very much for that. And it's good to see um, other people next to us um, helping pushing it along. Yeah, it's always it's great to, to hear um, your basically story behind that as well. And I've mentioned uh, Fronia's decade-long efforts earlier, and 2022 itself is a very special year for Fronia. So you're marking your 30th anniversary of the company's entry into the solar energy market. So um, you've touched up on it a bit, but can you elaborate more on Fronia's mission and specifically to deliver 24 hours of sun? Oh, yes, of course. I uh, really like to do this. Um, the, the basic idea behind 24 hours of sun is that the whole renewable energy industry has basically given a promise to society. And the promise is that we are supplying the, the society with full energy all year round, around, around the clock. And um, that's the mission that we all have to fulfill. And if we fail as a total sector, then the energy vendor won't be fulfilled. So the idea of 24 hours of sun basically is um, to say to the world, hey, we are providing, we as a sector, we are providing the right amount of energy at the right time to the right person who needs it. And that is the promise. And we're really working hard to, to fulfill that. We're not there yet not as Fronius, but we won't be able to do it on our own. And um, But we are, we are seeing the big picture. Uh, we're trying to actually get there. And um, that's the reason why we are um, very active into hydrogen, because you, you need to somehow um, catch the sun in the summer and take it to the winter. Uh, we, we are in storage systems uh, because you want to have the mid midday sun uh, in the evening. And... Um, we are on a good track, actually. So we are really confident. We have really done a lot, even as a whole industry. And that's the idea be behind 24 Hours of Sun. That's the promise. And we are really working hard to fulfill this promise and to make it come true. Um, yeah. And as you said, the energy transition can't be moved forward by yourself. And But all your efforts are appreciated in that sense. Um, and we've seen it in the past year that sustainability has really become increasing increasingly come into focus and we've just heard from our sustainability category as well and sustainability deservedly has become a focal point and you've touched on a few um, points there already hydrogen but what stops uh, what steps not stops definitely not stopping there but what steps is Fronia taking to address um, the, the sustainability focus point basically well we are manufacturer but in our belief, it's not enough just um, to manufacture a, a solar product and, and provide a good product to the market that, that helps with the energy. Um, it, it's important that we all rethink about how, how industrial production actually should be like. And um, in our opinion, um, even a production process needs to be regenerative, not just in energy, but also in material. And also with all the people involved in that. And for instance, we've even have got a kindergarten at, at our production site to, to make it possible to the people to come to work and, uh, and working in shifts when, when no, nobody usually is taking care of the kids. So we do that. Um, but even the material, uh, with the Gen 24, we have done um, life cycle analysis. 
we're using recycled material, for instance, aluminum. Um, and we, we've really made sure, we've, we've gone through great pains actually to make this possible, that at the end of a lifetime of an inverter, it's very easy to separate the materials so that the material can be fed back mm -hmm. into uh, the production process. So the aim basically is um, we want to have a footprint with our products as as little as possible. And if all industries would follow that line, um, we could be faster than that, but somebody's got to start. So that's what we do. And we are trying uh, to take a lead here, even in the solar industry. And I think we can all appreciate that. Jonathan, uh, are there any questions from your end? Um, well, from my, from my side, um, Ulrich, I'm interested, you know, the 24 hours of sun concept, um, you know, the core business for Fronius is, is the power electronics, the, the inverter systems. Um, and how does it work then, then working on these next generation products? How important is ongoing R&D spend and, and development? Because um, at the same time, you have to so supply this, this, this core market and, and manufacturing is a part of that, as you mentioned. But then also always be looking one step ahead, always be investing in R&D. So, so what, what is Fronius's approach there? Well, when we started off with inverters, uh, we just tried to make a really, really good inverter with high efficiency and all the rest of it. But when you follow the solar idea and um, you think about energy, and energy is not just electrical energy. Um, if you want to make this energy when they come true, we have to substitute fossil fuels in, in e-mobility. We have to substitute fossil fuels in heating. And... And the core task of the inverter is actually to manage very efficiently um, currents. That, that, that's what it is about. Um, but if um, immobility becomes electrified and if heating becomes electrified, then all those technical issues that have to be dealt with somehow need a brain, somebody to, to, to manage all that. And um, the inverter is on in the core of the system where, where all those energy flows have to be managed. And um, our R&D approaches now is we're, we're open up really, really wide, trying to actually integrate all the other uses of energy into a whole system idea. So we've opened up many interfaces so that other manufacturers can really easily connect to our system because what we need is if we want to get forward with the whole solar idea really fast, then we have to provide a whole wide set of different solutions to, to customers because that will make it easier for them actually to, to hop on the bus and, and, and go on the ride with us. So um, that's our um, big target in R&D now to, to have the big system integration mm. all with the with with aim of, of really great sustainability and efficiency. Excellent. Well, it is an exciting vision. And as the market continues to grow, you know, by, by focusing on efficient power conversion by, you know, when we look at modules, as we were talking about early, earlier, we've really got to a kind of price point where now we can look at this bigger um, picture and look at integration with e-mobility, with heating, with um, the whole gamut of things that need to be decarbonized. Ulrich Winter, congratulations to Fronius in its 10th year of solar en energy um, participation and, and production um, for picking up the Publishers Pick Award for 2021. Thank you very much and thank you for the great award. Thank you. My pleasure. Frederica, thank you very much thank also you. For, for standing in for Eckhart K. Goris today in our awards ceremony. Well, as I mentioned, we were able to get uh, Cab Solar, um, some of the technical um, issues ironed out, which is great news. Um, and as I understand, Tim Wedding is standing by to have a very quick chat to round out our awards ceremony. Tim, are you there? I think so. Ah, oh, fantastic. Good to see you. <laughs> nice to be seen. Thank you for um, having me. Oh, it's a great pleasure. And congratulations for picking up the Balance of System Award this year. I have to say, from a personal standpoint, when I heard that our independent jury had selected Cab Solar um, as a winner, I was absolutely delighted, not only because of the innovation within the product itself, but also because of your approach to production.
tell me a little bit about how does your shop, how does your factory work in terms of producing something that's really of use and of value to the solar industry, but is really giving back to the community? Great. Yeah, and thank you very much for the award. Um, on behalf of the uh, employees of CAB, I greatly appreciate it. We all greatly appreciate it. Um, so our, our shop is an integrated shop. We have really high-tech machines that bend um, the hangers, um, and then we integrate all of our employees together. Um, so everybody works side by side and, uh, to produce the hangers and the, the L brackets and the in pure kits and uh, to kit everything together and box it and get it ready for, uh, for shipping. Okay. And it, it's kind of important that it, it's, it's a simple kind of elegant solution because there's not really a plethora of manufacturing jobs today I suppose, where, where people who are less abled are able to participate in the manufacturing process. Is that right? Sure. And we, um, we cater the, uh, the jobs to people's abilities and uh, make it so they can, uh, they can contribute, which is, which is all anybody really wants is to contribute and to be uh, valued for their, for their purpose. So um, it's, it's been a blessing for us and a blessing for the many people that work for us. Well, and I imagine also makes an impact in the local community. Can can you share maybe a story from um, one of your employees or, or just give us a picture about how working, um, producing these cab solar products really makes an impact in their life? Um, so, yeah, we have between two and 300 um, persons with disabilities that work for us at any one time. Um, they're from our county in Cambria, also from surrounding areas. Um, the, the products that we produce and um, allows us the resources to uh, provide um, rehabilitation and social recreational opportunities for them. Um, we have employees that have worked for us for 40 plus years um, and they just, they love coming to work. So, I mean, it's, it is, it gives them a sense of belonging and uh, gives us a sense of um, we're able to contribute and to help them. And also being a part of the solar industry, you know, this is the, the big headline thing is that we are decarbonizing. We are a part of tackling um, climate change. And I think part of the story we tell within the industry is we have to do better when it comes to labor practices. We have to live to higher standards than perhaps other industries because it's all a part of um, this, this social mission and this social license. And I think um, Cab Solar being a part of the solar industry and picking up awards, not just as a charity, this is really a valuable contribution to what I believe is a very valuable industry, which is makes it particularly um, a, a good news story for me, Tim. It's, it's great to have you a part of the solar industry. And, and going forward, you're continuing to work on your products, continuing um, to, to refine them and, and work closely with, with solar developers to refine the solutions. Absolutely. We, um, we are always tweaking um, the system somehow. Um, we've had, we had hangers probably every week or so, different designs that uh, customers come to us with, and they want to carry a, a different set of cables for their system so we can tweak, um, tweak our design. And we're, because we make everything in-house, it's easier for us to do. Um, we also have tweaked our, uh, um, our integrated grounding system to provide different um, grounding conductors. We started off with a number three. Um, we moved on to a different number three that uses less copper, um, so is a better price point and uh, easier to use. Um, we also have begun to offer a number two equivalent, um, and we've also added other hangers that work under module. Um, either attached to the torque tube or uh, close to it. Okay. And there was one uh, question raised earlier in the BOS category presentation, just about your kind of geographical reach. So primarily North America, but also some reach in South America. Do you have any plans there to expand further? We're always open to, um, to new markets. We've, uh, we've got a couple of projects that are in Europe, um, some in Australia, um, as you mentioned, South America, um, in North America, in uh, Mexico, below or south of the border, um, and then all over the U.S., of course. 
Wonderful. Well, Tim Wedding from Cab Solar, thank you so much for persevering with the technology, um, <laughs> but also for your for your mission and the and the mission of everyone at Cab Solar. I think that's a really good news story to wind up wind up our uh, sure. award ceremony today. Thanks again for the award and the uh, the recognition. Um, my pleasure. Well, and selected by an independent jury. So, um, so absolutely. And one of our jurors actually had an experience um, in working on a project that had deployed the Cab Solar um, solution. So it had firsthand experience about um, how convenient and efficient it was. Tim, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for um, your attention today. Thank you for all of our um, jury representatives to our winners. Congratulations to all of um, all of them. Just to run through a quick recap, it was Jolie Wood in modules, SunGrow in inverters, Sono Motors in manufacturing with a really interesting vehicle integrated PV solution for solar electric vehicles. And I might just mention that the February edition of PV Magazine Global, which is coming out in just a few days, has really an extensive of coverage of the e-mobility space and how that interacts with solar, including charging stations, including battery storage, vehicle to grid, and also vehicle integrated PV and also Sono Motors is featured in there. The other winners were Fluence for the battery section, BESS category, Cab Solar, as we just heard, Viking Cold Solutions in the sustainability category and rounding it out um, in its 10th year in the solar industry, Fronius picked up the publisher's pick awards. Now, our awards will continue in 2022. We are slightly rejigging the format. There'll be two windows in which you can um, enter for our awards. Entry is free. I encourage everyone to get involved in 2021. We had a record number of entries. Let's build on that in 2022. Now, I mentioned our global publication as a little thank you for attending our ceremony today. Um, there is a discount code available um, if if you would like to take out a digital or a pin print subscription to the monthly magazine. Um, we love your support. It helps us to continue to do what we do at PV Magazine, um, including things like our awards. So I encourage you to join us at PV Magazine and take out a subscription. Um, a recording of this event will be online soon, so keep an eye out for that. You should get a notification into your inbox and you can share that around. Thank you very much also to everyone who worked behind the scenes on the ceremony today. Lucy de Melier, uh, Frederica Egra and Marina Rama, in particular for their work behind the scenes. And a huge thank you to all of our jurors. We have a really wonderful array of jurors from right around the world that share their time and expertise in selecting our finalists and reviewing many, many awards that come in throughout the year. Well, that's it for our 2021 award ceremony. My name is Jonathan Gifford. I'm the editor-in-chief of PV Magazine. It's been wonderful to have you with us today.